thank you for coming, everyone. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to Nick Shradolf, uh, one of our esteemed colleagues in machine learning. Uh, he'll be talking about stochastic quasi-Newton methods today. Uh, I first met Nick at the AI Stats Conference in 2000, where he taught me a drinking song, uh, which claimed there was no beer in Hawaii. Uh, something of a uh, jealous denial, I think, by uh, parts of Europe. From here, I'll hand it off to Nick. Thank you. All right, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I have to add to that that to a Bavarian, uh, whatever is available for purchase uh, in Hawaii does not qualify as beer. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm, my background is in machine learning. I grew up as a graduate student in the neural network days uh, of machine learning when everybody was excited about neural networks. And uh, to give a bit of a background, what bothered me more and more was that training neural networks proved to be very difficult. And this is not really a machine learning problem, it's an optimization problem, finding the optimal weights for the neural network. And it turns out that neural networks are real beasts to, to train. They're very hard, pose very hard optimization problems. And so the field as a whole has moved away towards other techniques uh, that are now used in, in machine learning a lot. And one of the underlying reasons for this movement away from neural networks was that these other systems were much simpler to optimize. However, what's happening lately, and what I see more and more um, since about two years ago or so, is that people are now realizing that these other techniques they're using, kernel uh, methods, support vector machines, and so on and so forth, have their own drawbacks. And there's now actually a kind of, the pendulum is swinging back and uh, neural networks, even though nobody calls them by that name, are actually coming back in disguise. And so um, I now find that uh, the work that I've been doing, which was concerned with improving the optimization of neural networks for a long time, is becoming more and more relevant pointing to the future. Um, so what I'll talk about today is actually not the well-rehearsed talk that I've given for the past five years when I talked about this, which was about an algorithm called SMD I developed in the past couple of years. But now I have something brand new, and what you'll see was presented for the first time last week, literally, at the AI Stats Conference in, in Puerto Rico and the Snowbird Learning Workshop, which also was in Puerto Rico, not in Snowbird this time. So this is all uh, brand new stuff, so I apologize in advance if it's not a completely polished presentation, but I hope it will be all the more interesting. To start off, I don't think I have to dwell here on the fact that we're drowning in a flood of information. Uh, you're well aware of that at Google. Um, there's two basic reasons. Uh, sensors are becoming more and more affordable and plentiful, and they're more and more networked. That's the basic underlying story. So you get more and more data. Here's some random examples um, in science, in business, in security. You probably can only laugh at this kind of volume. Uh, I don't have the numbers for Google, but they're probably a couple orders of magnitude larger. Um, what I find striking is in London, apparently, there are over 500,000 security cameras. And I'm wondering who's watching all that video? Right. So it's, it's clear we need some automated methods to process this data because we're generating far more data than the entire humanity can actually handle manually. Now, there's a problem. So we need uh, intelligent filters to cope with that. But the problem is that in order to cope with such a large flood of information, we need machine learning algorithms so machine learning is nothing but re reacting adaptively and intelligently to data. And, but we need algorithms that kind of fulfill three conditions at the same time. Since we have a lot of data, we may want to fit very large and complex models um, with millions of degrees of freedom. The data is, comes in high volume and it's low quality. Nobody has time to do any quality control, right? So you have noise, outliers, um, everything, non-stationary data, correlated signals. Uh, so you're moving far away from this ideal machine learning world where you have a, some small, finite set of data that is IID sampled from some known distribution and so on and so forth. 
And finally, uh, we want the answers in real time as things happen. And uh, typically, one of the reasons for, for that is that if we have these sensors generating data, there's always new data. So there's never a fixed training set where we say, OK, if we learn that, then we're happy, right? There'll, there's always more and more. And if the data is non-stationary, we need to adapt to it as we go along. Now, my claim is that current techniques have difficulty with this. And in particular, by that, I mean we're fulfilling all these three conditions at the same time. There's lots of techniques that can do two out of three. But all three is quite challenging. And there's a basic underlying reason for that. And that's the way classical optimization is set up. So in classical optimization for nonlinear problems, you have some iterative optimizer that goes around the loop and tries to, let's say, minimize uh, some objective function. However, to evaluate the objective function, which needs to be done every time you go around the loop, since that's defined over some training data set, you have to go through all your data. So the idea is, say, if your objective is to do a least squares regression from some inputs to some target values, and you try to minimize the, the squared error, you're summing that squared error over every item in your training set. So that's the inner loop. And then there's an optimizer around the outside. So you have two nested loops. Now, as the size of the data set grows, that becomes extremely inefficient. Because just to get a single evaluation of the function or its gradient, for instance, um, will take you far too long. So what you need in that situation is an online optimizer, where basically what happens is you're interleaving those two loops. So as you're optimizing your model, you're sampling new data. And those two processes are interleaved and go hand in hand. So now you've, you've interleaved it into a single loop. And that turns out to be far more efficient for large data sets. So this goes by many names. So um, you could call this adaptive filtering, stochastic approximation, online learning. Uh, none of the names fit very well. I think this is a, a fragmented area where people, depending on what field they've been coming from, have called this different things. Now, here's the same story in equations. Um, classically, you'd formulate your optimization problem like this. You're looking for some parameter vector theta star, which is the argmin. Uh, so it's the, set of, it's the parameter vector that minimizes the expectation of some loss function j over some data x. And the loss function is jointly defined on the parameters and the data. And since you can't compute the expectation, uh, what you do is you uh, approximate that by the average over some training set of data. That's called the empirical risk. Now, as I said before, for large data sets, that becomes inefficient. And if you have a never-ending data stream, uh, you know, you, there's no point to cut off this to compute an average. So it's completely the inappropriate framework. And so stochastic approximation what you're doing is you're roughly, you're performing a rough minimization at every sampling step of your parameter vector. But then you move on to the next data sample. Now, I have a picture here that shows you how that works. This is actual, um, an actual objective function from a video hand tracking task. Um, so we're looking at a two-dimensional slice of uh, about 30-dimensional parameter space. And these are contour lines for the value of the objective function. And here's a trajectory of a stochastic gradient descent. So we're going down the gradient of whatever sample of the objective function we have at the moment. And what you'll see is because it's stochastic, every time you evaluate the gradient, you're actually sampling from a slightly different function. And that's because you have different data available at that point in time. And what you can see is this is not just Gaussian noise. This is not just some, some clean additive noise on top or so. But this whole function is pumping and, and breathing in some, in some sense. So this unfortunately poses very tough problems for optimization. So stochastic approximation actually breaks a lot of these uh, optimizers. 
And in particular, two things that happen. Uh, one thing I, I talked about actually at the AI Starts conference four years ago that, that Paul mentioned initially is that conjugate directions uh, break down when you do stochastic approximation. The process of conjugating search directions and building a Krylov subspace for optimization uh, is very sensitive to noise. And so basically any amount of noise in that process will just completely derail it. Um, now, it happens that Krylov subspaces are one of the key tools of efficient optimization algorithms. So you can basically scratch that. As soon as you do stochastic approximation, that doesn't work. Another key tool are line minimizations. So a line minimization says, once I've decided on a direction in parameter space to go into, how far should I go? And a line minimizer basically gives me a point on that line in that direction that fulfills certain conditions. And there are various sets of conditions. They're called strong wolf conditions, Goldstein Armijo conditions, what have you. And it turns out that the convergence of many standard optimization algorithms critically hinges on these conditions being fulfilled. So there's a strong dependence on the line search actually returning a good point for you. Now, if you're doing stochastic approximation, you never know the actual function you're trying to optimize. All you have are samples from that function, noisy samples. So whatever condition you would like to be fulfilled, you can never guarantee it for the actual function. You can only say, well, on this sample, the condition holds. On the next one, maybe it won't. Or you can say, if you sample a lot, you can maybe say, well, this condition might hold with 90% probability or more. Right? So you can never guarantee um, these conditions that are needed by the classical optimization me methods. In particular, conjugate gradient again and quasi-Newton methods rely on these. And uh, finally, if you take the more expensive optimization methods, such as livenberg markward or, or Newton's method, um, they require an inversion of a matrix uh, at every point, at every iteration. And uh, that matrix is n by n if your parameter vector has n entries. And so that's an order n cubed, close to order n cubed process. That's fine if your iterations are slow. So if you have a large data set and you're going through all your data before you do one iteration, then it may well be worth to invert a matrix at the end of that process. But if you're online, every data item that comes in, you want to run an iter iteration of your optimizer then these algorithms just become too expensive to run that at such a high rate. So what does that leave? Oops, sorry, I'm behind. Um, what that leaves is what people have classically used when, they, when learning online, when doing stochastic approximation. And it's sort of the poor cousins of the, of the real optimization algorithms, namely, you can just do direct search, by which I mean search only using the function values, not the gradients. And if you have a smooth function that has nice gradients, but you're not using the gradients, um, by comparison, this leads to really glacial conversions. These are very slow optimization algorithms. They're very robust and reliable, but they're very, very slow to reach results. Um, next, one step up is simple first order gradient descent. So um, what, what you do for that is you literally say the new parameter vector is the old one minus some step size times the gradient of your function. The gradient always points in the steepest uphill direction. So if you're subtracting the gradient, you're going in the steepest downhill direction. So you're going to end up finding a local minimum of your function. Unfortunately, this is, can be very slow if your function is ill-conditioned. Um, ill conditioning, you can visualize, say, if your function has a bowl shape, but it's very elongated, like a canoe. Imagine a canoe shape, right? And if you're on one side of that canoe, your gradient is going to point across the valley. And so what you'll end up doing is you'll go back and forth across that valley, but you'll only very slowly make progress to the center of your canoe, actually. And this is very well, uh, can be very well ca uh, characterized mathematically. 
and has to do with the condition number of your system. And uh, simple gradient descent, uh, the convergence is basically proportional uh, to the reciprocal of the condition number, the convergence speed. Yes? So in traditional neural networks, uh, there is this acceleration of things. If you look yeah. back in several steps, you can see if you are moving in the same direction or going back and forth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, yes. So um, uh, it was mentioned that in neural networks, people have worked a lot on these acceleration methods. Um, uh, say, looking back uh, to see what, what happened over the last couple of steps and uh, uh, using that somehow to, to speed up the convergence. Um, that's true, and that's one of the good things that, that happened back then. And a lot of the work that I've done is actually in that vein. So. I've developed an algorithm, stochastic meta descent, which, is, which adapts the step size for the gradient descent. And it has a separate step size for each dimension in your parameter space. And it looks back and does the adaptation actually by looking back over an infinite window. And it carries along additional uh, gradient information. It basically carries along partials between the objective function and the step size or the log step size, actually. And you end up with a fairly complicated algorithm, which does substantially accelerate convergence. And there have been simpler things like momentum and so on. And they all work to some extent. They're all, at another level, um, a bit unsatisfactory, because they cannot change the fact that you're dealing with a first order gradient descent. You can accelerate it, but you're going to get a factor out of it of maybe three times, five times, perhaps if you're lucky, ten times faster convergence. But it doesn't change fundamentally the order of convergence. It's still a first order algorithm. And so these things are very, very useful in, in practice, and I use them all the time as well. And, and I've developed some of them. Um, but today, I'm actually happy I'll, I'll be talking about something that's, that has the chance of being fundamentally better. Um, yes, finally, to finish this slide, actually, I see on the next slide, I'll, I'll come to that. Um, the smartest thing people have done online uh, is basically two things that are very similar. One is natural gradient, which uh, basically means you multiply your gradient, you pre-multiply it by the inverse of the Fisher information matrix of your system. And the Fisher information in this context is just the covariance of your gradient. So your gradient is now a, a stochastic quantity. It's a random variable since it depends on your sampling. And you calculate, but then you move on to the next data sample. Now, I have a picture here that shows you how that works. This is actual, um, an actual objective function from a video hand tracking task. Um, so we're looking at a two-dimensional slice of uh, about 30-dimensional parameter space. And these are contour lines for the value of the objective function. And here's a trajectory of a stochastic gradient descent. So we're going down the gradient of whatever sample of the objective function we have at the moment. And what you see is because it's stochastic, every time you evaluate the gradient, you're actually sampling from a slightly different function. And that's because you have different data available at that point in time. And what you can see is this is not just Gaussian noise. This is not just some, some clean additive noise on top or so. But this whole function is pumping and, and breathing in some, in some sense. So this unfortunately poses very tough problems for optimization. So stochastic approximation actually breaks a lot of these uh, optimizers. And in particular, two things that happen. Uh, one thing I, I talked about actually at the AI Stats conference four years ago that, that Paul mentioned initially is that conjugate directions uh, break down when you do stochastic approximation. The process of conjugating search directions and building a Krylov subspace for optimization uh, is very sensitive to noise. And so basically, any amount of noise in that process will just completely derail it. Um, now, it happens that Krylov subspaces are one of the key tools of efficient optimization algorithms. So you can basically scratch that. As soon as you do stochastic approximation, that doesn't work. Another key tool 
are line minimizations. So a line minimization says once I've decided on a direction in parameter space to go into, how far should I go? And a line minimizer basically gives me a point on that line in that direction that fulfills certain conditions. And there are various sets of conditions. They're called strong wolf conditions, Goldstein Armijo conditions, what have you. And it turns out that the convergence of many standard optimization algorithms critically hinges on these conditions being fulfilled. So there's a strong dependence on the line search actually returning a good point for you. Now, if you're doing stochastic approximation, you never know the actual function you're trying to optimize. All you have are samples from that function, noisy samples. So whatever condition you would like to be fulfilled, you can never guarantee it for the actual function. You can only say, well, on this sample, the condition holds. On the next one, maybe it won't. Or you can say, if you sample a lot, you can maybe say, well, this condition might hold with 90% probability or more. Right? So you can never guarantee um, these conditions that are needed by the classical optimization me methods. In particular, conjugate gradient again and quasi-Newton methods rely on these. And uh, finally, if you take the more expensive optimization methods, such as livenberg markward or, or Newton's method, um, they require an inversion of a matrix um, at every point, at every iteration. And uh, that matrix is n by n if your parameter vector has n entries. And so that's an order n cubed, close to order n cubed process. That's fine if your iterations are slow. So if you have a large data set and you're going through all your data before you do one iteration, then it may well be worth to invert a matrix at the end of that process. But if you're online, every data item that comes in, you want to run an iter iteration of your optimizer then these algorithms just become too expensive to run that at such a high rate. So what does that leave? Whoops, sorry, I'm behind. Um, what that leaves is what people have classically used when, they, when learning online, when doing stochastic approximation. And it's sort of the poor cousins of the, of the real optimization algorithms, namely, you can just do direct search, by which I mean search only using the function values, not the gradients. And if you have a smooth function that has nice gradients, but you're not using the gradients, um, by comparison, this leads to really glacial conversions. These are very slow optimization algorithms. They're very robust and reliable, but they're very, very slow to reach results. Um, next, one step up is simple first order gradient descent. So um, what, what you do for that is you literally say the new parameter vector is the old one minus some step size times the gradient of your function. The gradient always points in the steepest uphill direction. So if you're subtracting the gradient, you're going in the steepest downhill direction. So you're going to end up finding a local minimum of your function. Unfortunately, this is, can be very slow if your function is ill-conditioned. Um, Ill conditioning, you can visualize, say, if your function has a bowl shape, but it's very elongated, like a canoe. Imagine a canoe shape, right? And if you're on one side of that canoe, your gradient is going to point across the valley. And so what you'll end up doing is you'll go back and forth across that valley, but you'll only very slowly make progress to the center of your canoe, actually. And this is very well, uh, can be very well ca uh, characterized mathematically and has to do with the condition number of your system. And uh, simple gradient descent, uh, the convergence is basically proportional uh, to the reciprocal of the condition number, the convergence speed. Yes? So in traditional neural networks, there, there is this acceleration thing that you can look yeah. back in several steps and see if you're moving in the same direction or you're going back and forth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, yes. So um, uh, it was mentioned that in neural networks, people have worked a lot on these acceleration methods. Um, uh, say, looking back uh, to see what, what happened over the last couple of steps and 
uh, using that somehow to, to speed up the convergence. Um, that's true, and that's one of the good things that, that happened back then. And a lot of the work that I've done is actually in that vein. So I've developed an algorithm, stochastic meta descent, which, is, which adapts the step size for the gradient descent. And it has a separate step size for each dimension in your parameter space. And it looks back and does the adaptation actually by looking back over an infinite window and it carries along additional uh, gradient information. It basically carries along partials between the objective function and the step size, or the log step size, actually. And you end up with a fairly complicated algorithm, which does substantially accelerate convergence. And there have been simpler things like momentum and so on. And they all work to some extent. They're all, at another level, um, a bit unsatisfactory because they cannot change the fact that you're dealing with a first order gradient descent. You can accelerate it, but you're going to get a factor out of it of maybe three times, five times, perhaps if you're lucky, ten times faster convergence. But it doesn't change fundamentally the order of convergence. It's still a first order algorithm. And so these things are very, very useful in, in practice, and I use them all the time as well. And, and I've developed some of them. Um, but today, I'm actually happy I'll, I'll be talking about something that's, that has the chance of being fundamentally better. Um, yes, finally, to finish this slide, actually, I see on the next slide, I'll, I'll come to that. Um, the smartest thing people have done online uh, is basically two things that are very similar. One is natural gradient, which uh, basically means you multiply your gradient, you pre-multiply it by the inverse of the Fisher information matrix of your system. And the Fisher information in this context is just the covariance of your gradient. So your gradient is now a, a stochastic quantity. It's a random variable since it depends on your sampling. And you calculate. Just note that it's basically, it involves this matrix and it uses a lot of inner and outer products between these S and Y vectors. So the, the parameter and gradient displacement, they're often called. Uh, just sort of get the, the general idea that we're going to have these two displacements that we're measuring. Uh, so comparing the last, basically quantifying the last step we did in parameter and in gradient space. And then we'll, we'll build the update out of that. Now, as it stands, this algorithm doesn't work with stochastic approximation. And people have tried. I've actually, since I'm giving this talk, several people have, have come and said, oh, I've tried intensely to get this to work online. And I'm, I'm really happy that we're the ones that actually managed to get it to work. So here's a list of the modifications we're doing to get this to work online. First of all, when you're online, your gradient depends on the data you're sampling in addition to the parameters. OK, first trivial change. Second, the line search doesn't work online, as I told you before, so we have to replace it. Fortunately, it turns out that you can do this. Um, in, when you do conjugate gradient and you're trying to do it online, you get stuck because conjugate gradient, the optimizer actually critically depends on doing an exact line minimization at every step. Otherwise, the conjugation of search directions doesn't work either. So if you can't do line minimization, you can't do conjugate gradient. For BFTS, it actually turns out the update for this B matrix, for the scaling matrix, is quite robust and independent of what your actual trajectory in parameter space is. In fact, you can feed random samples of displacements in parameter and gradient space into the B update, and you'll get a good curvature estimate. And this works even for negative curvature, for indefinite curvatures. It, it always works. So this is very, very nice. This means that you don't need the line search. Um, you just need to take a step in, in, a ni in the nice direction. And so what we're doing in the experiments here is something very, very primitive. We set our step size eta t to tau over tau plus t times eta 0, where eta 0 and tau are tuning parameters that we just hand tune. 
So this is a decay schedule. This is a typical online stochastic approximation gain decay. And this is a type of schedule that fulfills the technical conditions for convergence of a stochastic approximation algorithm. Uh, you may have heard Robbins-Monroe conditions. These are the most well-known set of conditions. So this is this type of gain decay. What happens there is, as you see more and more data, you'll take smaller and smaller steps. And you do this in order to converge on the overall minimum of your function instead of chasing the individual sampled minima, right? So intuitively, it's a very simple thing that happens here. This is clearly far from optimal. Um, I hope in future work that we can improve on this. Now, now we have this update. Yes? Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, the question actually aims towards what are the Robbins-Monroe conditions, and I can I can briefly mention them. Uh, uh, they're quite simple to understand. They basically say that the squared step sizes eta t, if you if you sum them all up um, over all time to infinity. The squared step sizes must be summable, so they must give you a finite value if you sum them all up. But the step sizes themselves must not be summable. So you must get infinity if you sum up all the step sizes. And it's essentially a statement about the rate at which the step sizes decay to zero as time goes to infinity. And essentially, if they decay too fast to zero, you'll get stuck before you reach the optimum. If they decay too slowly, you'll never actually converge to the optimum. You'll keep jiggling around. And these conditions basically formalize that. And this, uh, this schedule fulfills these conditions. So it's, it's of that type that and, uh, things converge nicely. All right, so here's the, the B op, uh, update. Now uh, we have a, a trivial change. First, obviously, the gradients depend on our data now as well. However, this is not what we do. This is what everybody else who's tried it before has done. So it's completely natural when you do stochastic approximation and you think of a difference of two gradients at different time steps to take this difference, right? You have the gradient on the new data and the new parameter value minus the gradient on the old data and the old parameter value. The problem, though, is that this allows sampling noise to enter into Y and hence to enter into your update for the B matrix. And that's because XT and XT plus 1 are different data samples. And they may tell you very different things about the objective function. So you get uh, a sampling error basically entering your update here. And that, that noise that enters is, uh, basically derails the whole algorithm. There's a very simple way to fix that. But it comes at the cost of increasing your cost per iteration by a factor of two, unfortunately. And that's this. You take this difference, evaluate it on the same data. Now there's no sampling noise here. This difference is a deterministic quantity. However, what you have to do the, to, to get this is you have to compute the gradient at the new parameter value, but on the old data. And then at the next step, you'll need the gradient at the new parameter value, but on the new data. So it's twice as many gradient evaluations. So that's something I cannot avoid, um, this factor of two. However, uh, what I'm seeing now is there's actually, once you have these twice as many gradient evaluations, there's many, many interesting things you can do besides taking this difference. For instance, you can use these gradients also to compute the difference between gradients at the same point in parameter space, but for different samples of your data. What does that give you? It gives you a, a very nice estimate of the Fisher information, right? Because you're now really not looking at the curvature of your objective function. You're just looking at a single point at the sampling uh, process that, and how that affects the gradients. So I think there's a lot of algorithms still hiding in there. Once you realize that you have to distinguish between the gradient at theta t plus 1, xt plus 1, the one at theta t plus 1, xt, and the one at theta t, xt plus 1, and the one at theta t, xt. Right? There's four different quantities 
flying around here. And depending on how you take differences and how you compare them to each other, you get quite different, uh, you, you can measure diff quite different things. So that you have to look here at the Hessian and the Fisher information as two completely separate quantities that are unrelated, in fact. They, they measure different processes. So this will be an area that will be very interesting to look into for, for optimization. Now this was the key change to make the algorithm work, but since we don't have a line search, we just have a simple gain decay, it turns out that we have to add some more seat belts to the algorithm to prevent divergence on, on nasty functions. And one of these seat belts is that we try not to estimate the inverse Hessian, but we take the Hessian plus some scalar lambda, some tuning parameter lambda times the identity and the inverse of that. It turns out that's very easy to do. Basically, for y, you just add lambda times s to y, and then you run the normal update, and that's it. Um, so that's, that's pretty much it. There's one more little change. So here's the standard BFGS update formula. And we've added another scaling factor in here, um, which empirically we found to improve behavior, a, a factor that's somewhat smaller than 1. We might use 0 0.1, 0 0.2, uh, 0 0.5. Um, there's a lot of literature on scaling BFGS updates. And so this is another area where we're just at the moment doing something heuristic and that, that can probably Im be improved. And we'll link this actually. Uh, it looks like this kind of stuff, both the lambda and the C can be linked to regularization in different metrics of your objective function. So we hope to actually get rid of these as tuning parameters by, by calling them instead regularization parameters. and then. It's the fault of the machine learners, not the optimizers, that you have them, and you have to find a value for them, right? So that's the idea. <laughs> we'll, we'll sweep them under the rug. Um, anyway, that's, that's a lot of what keeps us currently occupied. Now, once you have the C parameter, you'll also scale the, the step in the reciprocally with C. That's just a technical detail, because it scales the B matrix. OK, now that's the whole story. That's all the, all the changes we made. Now, for limited memory BFGS, whoops, why am I not going forward? Here we are. Uh, limited memory BFGS is a variation by Moray and Nosidal on BFGS. And what it does is instead of trying to estimate the full inverse Hessian, it constructs a rank 2M approximation to that estimate. And, uh, M is a tuning parameter. It's your choice. And due to that flexibility, it's become really the dominant algorithm for nonlinear smooth optimization. And literally, uh, whenever you, you call a standard optimizer for some, on some nonlinear smooth problem, it will under the hood run LBFGS, uh, at least I'd say 90% of the time. This is an incredibly widespread algorithm. Um, the way it works is you maintain a ring buffer of the last m values of the s and y vectors. There's also a scalar rho t that you, you remember the last m values of. And then you use this algorithm to calculate your direction. So the direction is eta t, b t times g t, where g t is the gradient. Um, and this loop actually calculates this quantity. I don't want to explain it in too much, too much detail here. It's sort of a bit of linear algebra magic going on. Um, and it does so without ever calculating the B matrix in full. It's another one of these implicit uh, matrix-free methods. So it calculates the matrix vector product, B, T, G, T, uh, and, and does not need to construct the full matrix. And that reduces the cost per iteration from order n square, if the B matrix is n by n, to order m n, where m is your choice of buffer size. And this has made this algorithm incredibly popular. Uh, for m equals 1, you can actually relate the resulting algorithm to conjugate gradient methods. So another way to think of quasi of LBFGS is it's a generalization that sort of gives you a smooth interpolation from a conjugate gradient method to a Newton method. And you decide where on that, on that slope you want to be. 
uh, depending on how much computational resources you have. And I just want to say the online variant is very, very straightforward. We take the same type of modifications we did before, literally the identical modifications, we just apply them here to this algorithm, and we get a, a, a variant that works online. Okay, let's get to some results. So, um, to benchmark these algorithms, what we do is we, we take a quadratic model. So, um, since these, these algorithms are, are basically designed for using a quadratic model of the objective, we first evaluate them on an actual quadratic. However, we make the quadratic stochastic and we make it ill-conditioned. And so, the first type of quadratic is what I call realizable. And uh, the objective function here looks like, like the following here. It's theta minus theta star transpose, j x x transpose, j transpose theta minus theta, theta star, where x is a matrix of data. So this is your data that you're sampling. And uh, the individual entries are just uh, normal distrib normally distributed IID random variables. So this is basically pure noise that's coming in here. The noise is then colored by a Jacobian J. And this is just a constant uh, matrix. And this is how we get ill conditioning in. Because we pick a Jacobian, uh, which is essentially, we modify a Hilbert matrix to make it semi-sparse and, and give it some nasty properties. And we'll, we'll have here about a condition number of 5,000 in a five-dimensional problem. So it's, it's quite ill-conditioned, just to, to emphasize the difference between different algorithms. Um, yeah, and that's, that's really it. And then finally, note here that your X matrix is basically comes from R to the N times B, where N is the size of your parameter vector. And B is the mini batch size. So it's literally how many data vectors are you batching together before you run an optimization step. So if B is one, you're fully online because for every new data vector that comes in, you run an optimization step. In the limit as B goes to infinity, you're appro approaching the batch algorithm, the, the conventional optimization algorithm that wants to see all the data before it does an optimization step. But you can do anything in between, right? So you can set up your system depending on the data rates, your computing power to say every five data vectors that come in, I do an optimization step. And turns out these mini, mini batches of data is actually one of the successful techniques from the neural network era. Um, these are often the most efficient setups. So what I'll plot here is this summarizes a whole host of experiments. So what you'll see here is along the bottom on a log axis, the mini batch size. And this goes from one, which is fully online here, and going in powers of 10 up to 10 to the five. So up to the right here, you're in the batch regime. And as you go to the left, you're more and more online until here you're fully online. And on the Y axis, you have also on the log scale, the number of data points needed to converge to a given criterion, which in this case was, I think, reaching 10 to the minus 15 in function value. Um, and this goes from 100,000, 10,000, up to 10 million on a log scale. And this is literally how many data vectors do you need to see before you reach that point. So this allows us to, to compare all these algorithms uh, with each other. Now, um, let's start with the bad ones. Um, so the gray one here is first order stochastic gradient descent with a hand-tuned optimal step size. So this is, this is how well you can do it. The, the problem is very ill-conditioned, so this algorithm looks quite bad. Incidentally, we are all uh, topping out here as a, at, a, at a, all these curves go flat up there because that's just when we break off the simulation. So even if it doesn't converge, after this many iterations, we just give up and we, we call it that value. So if we'd really plotted these, these things here would keep going up but it would take an infinite amount of time to compute what the curve actually looks like. So um, this is basically very bad behavior up there and we don't care anymore what happens up there. Now uh, let's take the next algorithm. 
natural gradient. Uh, you can see why people are excited about it. It does a lot better than first order conjugate gradient. So that's the green one here. Um, so we're getting down fully online. It needs about between 1,000 and 2,000 data points to converge, which is very fast for a condition number of 5,000. Um, and then as you go more and more to the batch regime, it becomes more and more inefficient. Now the blue dashed line here is batch BFTS. So this is unmodified BFTS. Um, in particular, what we did here is, is we, we did not take this gradient difference in the right way. We just took it in the naive way that as other people have done before. And what you see is you get very good performance here in the batch regime. But for batch sizes below 1,000, it starts to diverge. And that's just because the sampling noise becomes too much. Um, with our modification, we have online BFTS. That's the red curve. And the good behavior goes, goes right through until at fully online, we join up with, with natural gradient at the same performance. I believe that this is actually represents the optimal performance achievable on this problem. Now, uh, for limited memory BFTS, we have two curves. This is with a relatively small buffer size of four. And what you see is that as you go more and more online, the buffer is just too short to, do a, to get a good curvature estimate. If we increase the buffer size to m equals 10, we're essentially at the same performance as full BFTS. Now, this problem in some ways is hard, but in others it's still an artificially simple problem, and that's because it's a realizable problem. Realizable means that if you just find an optimum on every data sample, the intersection of all these optima on the individual samples is the global optimum. At, and in other words, there's no, the data doesn't contradict each other. There's not a, a situation where one data item says the optimum's over here, the other one says it's over there. They all point towards the global optimum. So it's very easy to find. A much more realistic scenario is non-realizable problems, where basically um, there's contradiction in the data, and the, the global optimum is the best compromise location, where everybody is moderately happy, but no on no individual sam sample are you actually uh, having zero loss. And so we have a non-realizable model. It's basically the same as the one on the left, but you add uh, additional noise in a, in a particular place. You add another source of Gaussian noise in a particular place, and you can tune how much. And that makes the problem far more difficult. And what we get now, interestingly, is that natural gradient is now as bad as first order gradient descent. And I have a reason why this this is, and it, it's connected with the fact that at the optimum, since nobody's really happy on the individual samples, you get non-zero gradients. And if you take the covariance matrix of that, it has quite large eigenvalues, so the inverse has small eigenvalues. And so the algorithm kind of freezes up because it gets contradictory information. Interestingly, when you talk to natural gradient guys, they say it's a feature. They say, oh, that's the purpose of natural gradient. When you get contradictory information, you're conservative. You, try and you don't react to it. But interestingly, you know, we react to this con contradictory information, and we do just fine. Right? We can actually optimize far, far faster by, not by basically subtracting out the sampling noise and then saying, I don't care how large the sampling noise is, how much contradiction there is in the data. I trust my averaging over time to do the job for me. And for the optimization, all I care about is the curvature of the objective function, not the sampling process of the data. So I come more and more to the conclusion that there's a fundamental uh, sort of uh, 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 difference in opinion coming up here. And um, I'm wondering to what extent I should actually uh, go at some point and stand up and say natural gradient is the wrong thing to do. I'm doing this now in a small audience, but uh, I wouldn't do that yet at a conference, but maybe next year, you know. I need to run some more experiments and firm, firm this whole story up. But it looks to me like it's really, there's a really fundamental difference. And we have the potential to be doing much, much better than natural gradient. 
So another exciting thing we'll try is we'll go into areas where natural gradient is used with our algorithm and we'll see if we can, you know, beat the pants off them. And if so, then we, we can brag about it, right? So here, the, briefly, the story is both for, for a limited memory with large buffer size and the BFTS we're doing just great. Now, finally, um, let's look at a real uh, example, some, some more realistic problem. This is training a conditional random field with online limited memory BFTS. This is on the Connell 2000 text chunk chunking task. This is a natural language processing problem. And um, the, the thing to keep in mind here is you have half a million parameters. So this is very richly parameterized. And because of that half a million, you could never use full BFTS or natural gradient because it would be order half a million squared per iteration. So here we use uh, limited memory BFTS, I believe, with m equals 10. And um, some other algorithms, so my stochastic meta descent algorithm is in there, first order stochastic gradient descent. And the green dashed line is batch LBFTS, which was the state of the art uh, of training before we moved in into that. And you can see here, this is passes through the data. Here's one pass, here's 10, here's 100. All the stochastic gradient methods are far, far faster than the batch methods. And this is here still on a fairly small data set. I think it's about 9,000 sentences of English. But the, the stochastic approximation gives you such a huge advantage by running the optimizer for every sentence you get in, you're already doing optimization. So by the time this LBFTS, you know, this is, LBFTS is actually doing very few iterations here. It needs about 30 iterations to do well. But by the time it's done these 30 iterations, we're already done. So here's a, a, a zoom in on the final area here. Um, so we're, all the stochastic algorithms are much faster. Um, the stochastic first order gradient algorithm has the worst asymptotic performance and then uh, SMD does better than that. And with the online quasi-Newton, we're doing better than SMD asymptotically, though initially SMD is faster and that has to do with the fact that SMD gives you an optimized step size, whereas here we don't really know yet how to do step size optimization or adaptation well. So what I have here is uh, a great way to compute quasi-Newton directions, search directions online. Um, but the future work will focus on the step size and the other tuning parameters that we have. And we need to get that working online. Um, I won't have time to talk about the uh, RKHS uh, stuff, but basically just trust me, we can do this in a reproducing Colonel Hilbert space. Um, if you're interested in that particularly, uh, email me. I can send you a draft paper. It's submitted to KDD. And let me just skip to the conclusions. So as I've said, we, we can do the directions. I think I, I consider that a solved problem now. Um, the, all the implications of that will, of course, be exciting to, to explore. I've talked a bit about the relationship to a natural gradient. Um, there's another bunch of question, interesting questions there. Um, on our to-do list is analytical proofs of convergence for this algorithm. And we are quite close. So um, we have a proof of the fact of convergence for a very closely related algorithm to the one we're actually using. We don't have convergence rates yet, but we think we know how to get them. And so we will probably come up with a revised algorithm and a convergence proof in conjunction. I, I would say that's within a few months uh, we should have that. Um, what's more difficult is handling all these tuning parameters that we had to introduce because we had to throw out the line search. And here, um, we'll have to come up with some ways. Uh, I've mentioned that maybe some of them can be uh, turned into regularization parameters. For the step size, maybe we can do some adaptive uh, mechanism because I've developed adaptive step size mechanisms before, so I, I kind of know how to, how to do that. So I'll try that in this context. Um, obviously, in the end, what we'd really like to have is sort of a black box algorithm because that's what made 
batch quasi-Newton methods, batch BFTS and LBFTS so successful. There were no tuning parameters. You just throw your function at it and it works. I don't know if we get to that kind of level of robustness with this algorithm, but we'll try. In particular, this uh, is true for non-convex optimization problems. So right now, we are only using this algorithm for convex problems, and the reason is in that we don't have a good way to, to handle these tuning parameters. For non-convex problems, say neural networks, for instance, uh, multi-layer perceptrons, you really want a good adaptive way to handle these parameters, and we don't have that yet. And finally, uh, yeah, the, the, the kernel LBFTS ver uh, version needs to be explored in more detail. Okay, thank you very much. If there's further questions, I'll be happy to answer them. I'm around also today, and I think for lunch there's, a, there's time and so on, so uh, do come up and mix and mingle. Thank you. Yes. Ah, mm -hmm. Yes. So, so the question was that uh, in stochastic approximation, often there are two schedules. Um, it's basically one, one step to, to estimate the change in gradient, and, and another is the actual step that you're taking. And yeah, we are not making that distinction at this point. So uh, this could come in at some point. Right now, we're, we've been sort of refraining from that. Uh, because it's, we feel it's something that can always be added. Um, it, for instance, I mean, there's Polyak averaging which does that, right? Uh, it's one form of doing, doing this. Uh, so uh, there you, your optimization algorithm runs on an actually rougher trajectory, and, and at every point the solution that you're actually using is the, the average of all previous solutions. And that's sort of one way to get these different step sizes. So we haven't thought much about that yet. This is maybe on, should be on the, on the to-do list. It, it could be interesting, yeah, yeah. Yes? Which dimension? Excuse me? What's the filter dimension? Oh, oh um, it depends on the algorithm, right? So for BFGS, um, you need a fairly small dimension. But, uh, you know, whatever you're comfortable with on order n squared update, whatever n you're comfortable with, and it depends. So I could imagine n up to 1,000 uh, to be quite reasonable unless you have some sort of high real-time requirements. But for larger dimensionalities, what people just use is LBFGS. And that goes up to, I, I guess it's limited in the end by your RAM, right? Uh, because you need to somehow process your data. But, uh, so we've used 500,000 on this, on this CRF problem, and it's, it's no particular challenge. So you can certainly go up into the millions, if not more.